How many of you have heard of something called foxhole prayers? Foxhole prayers, okay, big, big group of you have. These would be prayers that people will pray in the midst of dire need or distress. Uh, the way it became known as a foxhole prayer is that uh, soldiers who would be uh, dug in before an enemy that was barraging them with gunfire or artillery, they would pray in their foxhole and say, oh Lord, if you'll get me out of this, uh, you know, and you make a promise like I'll serve you with my whole life or I will, you know, give so much money or different kinds of things that people would promise in their foxhole, right? And uh, some foxhole prayers turn out to be really like life-changing, the prayers that people pray. Other foxhole prayers turn out to be like after the crisis is over, they kind of forget about what they'd prayed, right? Uh, this morning, I invite you to open your Bibles to Genesis chapter 32, and we're going to see a foxhole prayer, as it were, a prayer made in desperation, out of fear, a uh, fear that leads to prayer. We are in a study in uh, the lives of Isaac and of Jacob called The Promise of God's Goodness in a World of Deceit. Uh, and our story up to this point, if I can review it, is that God gave a promise to Abraham that he would start with him and build a family. From that family would come a nation. From that nation would come a savior. And from that savior, all the peoples of the earth would be blessed. And that's Genesis chapter 12. It's repeated in 15 and 17 and 22, various places. And then God gave that promise, extended to Abraham's son, Isaac in Genesis 26, and then that promise got extended to Jacob, Isaac's son, in Genesis chapter 28. Uh, now, this is despite the fact that Jacob has been a real rascal, okay? He's just, I mean, a cheater, a deceiver, uh, a, in some ways, uh, a, a guy that you just wouldn't want to enter into any kind of business relationship with because you think he's going to take advantage of you. Um, he stole the birthright. He stole a blessing from his uh, twin brother who is older, Isaac. And as a result of that, Jacob is the inheritor of this blessing and this line of promise. And Esau is so mad, he's decided, I'm going to kill him. I'm going to kill my brother. And so, Jacob hightails it 500 miles north from Beersheba to a place called Haran, where his parents had told him, go up there, don't marry a Canaanite. Instead, go up to our people and marry somebody from within our clan, and that way this line of promise will be maintained. And so Jacob does that. He heads up 500 miles to this, uh, this place where he meets up with his clan, and turns out, uh, meets a girl, only the surprise is that he's deceived and he gets her sister as a wife instead of the one he really wants. He's worked seven years for the older sister and then he works seven years to get the, uh, in obtaining the, the, the girl of uh, his desire, Rachel. And so he's worked 14 years for his wives and then he's worked six more years to try to get a stake of his own. Last week, we looked at how uh, Jacob has uh, had enough of his father-in-law Laban, and he leaves Laban, and we saw that departure last week. And now, Jacob, after 20 years, is re-entering this land of promise. Um, as he does so, let's look at verses 1 through 8. We will see that good fear... And bad fear motivates prayer. Good fear and bad fear. Verse 1, Jacob went on his way and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. So he called the name of that place Mahanaim. And Jacob sent messengers before him to Esau, his brother, in the land of Seir, the country of Edom, instructing them, thus you shall say to my Lord Esau, thus says your servant Jacob. I have sojourned with Laban and stayed until now. 
I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male servants and female servants. I have sent to tell my Lord in order that I may find favor in your sight. And the messengers returned to Jacob saying, we came to your brother Esau and he is coming to meet you. And there are 400 men with him. We should all go, dun, dun, dun. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. He divided the people who were with him and the flocks and herds and camels into two camps, thinking if Esau comes to the one camp and attacks it, then the camp that is left will escape. Good fear and bad fear motivates prayer. In verses 1 and 2, we have the good fear, right? The meeting of the angels of God, uh, literally messengers of God. There's some mystery here in these two verses. Is Jacob happy about meeting these messengers of God? Is he scared? Uh, in any event, the element of surprise is certainly here. His exclamation, this is God's camp, uh, certainly suggests that it's a good thing in his mind. And one of the things that you'll see quite often in the Bible is the naming of a place to recall an event. And Jacob names this place Mahanaim. Uh, it means two camps. Okay, time to give you a little bit of a Hebrew lesson here. In English, we have singular and plural, right? But in Hebrew, there's, uh, there's a third one. You got singular and you got plural, but when you want to refer to two and only two, you use what's called dual. And so quite often when you see the thing that ends in ayim, uh, that's a, a dual thing. Mahanayim means two camps. And what Jacob's referring to here, I believe, is that there's a difference between God's camp and my camp. There's a difference between heaven and earth. There's a difference between God's camp and my camp. Now, this Mahanaim actually plays a fairly prominent role in the future events in the Old Testament. So, for example, when David is becoming king, Saul's son, Ishbosheth, is a rival to David in asserting kingship. And Ishbosheth uh, has his capital here at Mahanaim. When David is uh, on the run from Absalom, you remember his son Absalom who staged a coup, and, and, and so David runs away, and where does he hide? He hides at Mahanaim. Uh, this Mahanaim is a place that is a place of gathering, but also a place that can be secure. You can kind of have some protections available. Uh, let me... You know I've got a map, right? Yeah, so we've got a couple of maps here. This is a map that describes Jacob's travels up north where he spent the last 20 years. Uh, this shows his return, and this time, instead of going down to the west side of the land of promise, he heads over to what's called Transjordan, the east side. Uh, and the reason is going to be evident in a moment. It's because that's where Esau is and he's decided, I'm going to meet the problem head on rather than wait for it. And so you'll see here in the ironic colors of orange and blue, go Illini, uh, Jacob coming down from the north and Esau coming up from the south. Uh, let's get in a little closer and you'll see that over in Transjordan, there are a variety of canyons that make it difficult for there to be routes and passageways. Um, it's not like here in the Midwest where we just have north, south, east, west grids, right? You have to get around these big canyon systems. And so one possible way in which Jacob got around these was to go around to the east I actually think he went around to the west, to this place circled in orange called Mahanaim. He's avoiding the Yarmuk Canyon system, and then he enters into this Jabbok Canyon system, which is a very difficult place, but a place where he can hide and be protected 
while he figures out what he's going to do with his approaching brother Esau and his 400 men. Uh, just to give you a sense of some of the area here, oh, let me back up. Uh, that, that little place called Garasa, just to the northeast of the green circle, Jabbok Canyon, that place, Garasa, is a place that later the Romans built a big city there. It was one of the cities of the Decapolis in the time of Jesus. So there's a lot of great remains there. If you ever want to visit, you'll want to go there and just see the magnificent sights there. Uh, while I was there, I got to see shepherds out in the field. And uh, here's a shepherd just sitting there in his ubiquitous plastic armchair. Those chairs are everywhere, all over the world. You can't ever get away from them. Every, literally every place I've ever been has these chairs. Whoever made those has made a lot of money. Okay. Um, and you'll see the family in the background there. So you get a kind of a sense of Jacob with his herds, right? Uh, here's a couple of pictures of the Jabbok system. The reservoir was not there in Jacob's day. Instead, it's just a <clears throat> really difficult places to traverse. Here's another picture of this Jabbok system. Jacob hiding away on the north side of the Jabbok in anticipation with all of his fears that Esau is going to come against him. You see, he's got the good fear of meeting the messengers of God, but now he's sending out his own messengers to find out where Esau is and to tell him the story. And we might ask at this point, you know, we've been through this whole thing with Jacob for quite a while, quite a number of weeks now. What, what's Esau been doing these last 20 years, right? Isn't that a good question? What's he been doing? Well, even though he hated Jacob and wanted to kill him, that apparently did not dominate Esau's life. As a man of passion, as Esau was, it seems that being out of sight caused Esau to put his attention elsewhere. Esau was just kind of reacting emotionally to events as they happened to him, and when it wasn't in his vision, he kind of forgot about it. In fact, with the Canaanite wives that he had making life hard on Isaac and Rebekah, and having lost out on the blessing, Esau apparently took his now three wives over to the Transjordan in the south of that Transjordan area to a place called Seir. It is just here that just as Jacob had made a life for himself 500 miles north up in Haran, Esau has now made a life for himself in this area of Seir. And while Jacob must have surely been on his mind as he thought about it, the issue took a back seat to his getting on with his life. The completely unknown thing that the, our text is making us feel is how is Esau going to respond to Jacob's return after 20 years of being away? Justifiably concerned, Jacob instructs his messengers to go find Esau. There apparently is some prior information that Esau is in the Transjordan, so Jacob's being very proactive here by confronting the big issue head on. He goes to the Transjordan, and he sends out messengers with a message for Esau. Here's the message. I've been with Laban until now, 20 years. Uh, it just so happened that I've accumulated a lot of stuff. Uh, uh, this implies Esau. I'm not after any of your stuff. <laughs> I'm sending these messengers so that I might find favor in your sight. And in fact, he calls his brother Esau, my Lord, twice, once in verse four and once in verse five. In verses six to eight, the messengers return to Jacob with uh, some startling news. Uh, they say, we've met Esau and also um, he's coming to meet you. And he has 400 men with him. Woo, that's going to create some scary things. Hearing that Esau is coming with 400 men is frightening. Our text describes it vividly. There in verse 7, 
Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. If we we're gonna translate it in, in a very literal way, Jacob feared greatly and it was cramped to him. Just cause every muscle in your body to cramp up. Jacob's actions then are military defensive measures at a defensible position there at the Jabbok on the north side, there at this Mahanaim. And, and Jacob builds two camps. And his theory is, his reasoning is, if Esau gets one, maybe the other one will be able to escape. And again, this idea of two camps appears. Only this time, instead of one being God and the other being Jacob's, Jacob has divided his own camp into two. It is just here, out of this desperation, in the good fear of meeting the messengers of God, and the bad fear of what in the world is, Je is Esau going to do to me, that Jacob goes to prayer. Prayers of desperation bring an earnestness to our encounters with God. It's prayers of desperation that bring an earnestness to our encounters with God. This is kind of the central section of this passage of scripture, so we'll camp here for a while. Did you catch camp? Okay, good, I'm glad you're listening. Desperate times call for desperate praying. And Jacob now prays in a way that up until this point, we have not heard from him. But up until now, he's kind of an arrogant guy. Yes, I actually believe he became saved, a true follower of God in chapter 28. But even with that, he's still kind of a guy that feels like he can do things on his own. But bit by bit, this arrogance is being stripped from this patriarch. He now calls upon God. And this prayer is helpful instruction in how we can pray in desperate times. Have you ever been in a time where you really don't know if you will survive or not? Oh, well, maybe it's literal in terms of your physical life, but it also may be that you are in such a desperate condition emotionally, you just don't know, I don't know how I'm going to survive this. Let's look at Jacob's prayer and see if we can find some help, huh? Verse 9, Jacob begins by addressing God. O oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, O oh Lord. By saying God of my father Abraham and Isaac, he's talking to God as the God of promise. The promise is made in chapter 12 to Abraham, the promise made to Isaac in chapter 26, the promise God himself made in that dream at Bethel in chapter 28. This promise that there would be a blessing to this individual that would create a family, that would create a nation from which would come a savior through whom would come the blessing of the nations. He's the God of promise, and he is the Lord. You see that? Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. The very one who, whom he met in his dream at Bethel, the words that were used that from Jacob's lips in chapter 28, verse 21, if God will go with me, keep me in this way that I go, so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then the Lord shall be my God. So he's not just saying God of Abraham, he's not just saying God of Isaac, by saying the name Lord, he's saying, and, and you're my God, you're my God too. We need to address God when we pray. That, that, that sounds kind of axiomatic, right? Obvious. We need to address God. But I am amazed at how many times I, and I'm sure you as well, We'll talk all around the crises and the problems and never go to God. Or if we do, we kind of go in a slapstick kind of way, just kind of, well, we've done with all the talking, let's just pray, Lord bless us all, amen. Now, I am not suggesting that God's requiring some lengthy address. But Jacob's prayer helps us as we observe that he addresses God both from the point of covenant 
promise loyalty and from the point of his self-existence. That word Lord describes God's self-existence. So Jacob begins first by addressing God. Secondly, he recalls the word of God. Look at the second half of verse nine. O Lord, who said to me, He's recalling the word of God. He recalls what God had told him back in chapter 31, verse 3, that it was time to return to the land of promise. We need to recall the word of God and speak God's word back to him. Now, God, of course, does not need the reminding, but he delights in hearing his children recite his word back to him. We need to recite God's word to God in prayer. Praying the word of God is the single clearest way to pray in the will of God. It is only a people who are soaked in the word of God who will be able to bring more than a casual lifting of God's words back to him. You've been with people like that, haven't you? You can be with believers and they're very shallow in their faith and their reminders of God's word back to him are just basically the same kind of trite phrases over and over. And then once in a while you will meet with someone who knows the word of God through and through and their encounter with God is so precious and intimate and you just are like, oh, I want to be near that person. I want to have the blessing that I see in their life flow to me too. It's much like how you would experience with your own children or grandchildren, right? Have you ever had something where you've said something over and over to your children or your grandchildren and then all of a sudden, just out of the blue, they recite it back to you? And you go, yes, they got it. And that's how God is. He wants to hear us speak his words back to him. Verse 10, thirdly, Jacob states his complete powerlessness and unworthiness and God's great love and faithfulness. Notice what he says, verse 10. I am not worthy of the least of all the deeds of steadfast love and all the faithfulness you have shown to your servant. I'm not worthy Literally, I am too small. And is that not true of all of us? I am too small. Too small for all of the loving kindness, for all of the faithfulness and truthfulness that you have done to your servant. Jacob says, I had just a staff in my hand when I went those 500 miles north. And now I've become two camps. He's got four wives. Rachel and Leah and the the two servant girls that he'd taken as a wife, along with 11 boys that are seven years of age and under, along with one daughter, at, at least one, Dinah. And now here he is with all these animals and servants and all of this. I had just a staff when I left. We need to state our unworthiness before God's great loving kindness and truthfulness and faithfulness. We need to acknowledge that we had nothing and that God has given us everything. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17, as for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be haughty nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Or if you're looking for an Old Testament text, Deuteronomy chapter eight, verse 17, beware lest you say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gotten me this wealth. You shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth that he may confirm his covenant that he swore to your fathers as it is this day. So Jacob begins by addressing God. He recalls the word of God. He states his complete powerlessness and unworthiness and God's great love and faithfulness. And now, verse 11, he makes his request. It is not wrong to begin with your request, but boy, this is a helpful way to get to a request, to warm your heart toward God. And here's what Jacob does, verse 11. He says, please, 
Deliver me from the hand of my brother for the hand of Esau, for I fear him that he may come and attack me, the mothers with the children. Very clear, plainly stated. Please deliver me. Because, and the emphasis is here, I myself fear him that he might attack me, the mothers and the sons. We need to make our requests known to God too, don't we? That's how Paul put it to the church at Philippi. Don't be anxious about anything. But in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. The peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Addressing God, recalling the word of God, stating our complete powerlessness and unworthiness with God's unbelievable love and faithfulness, making our request to him. Jacob doesn't end there. Look at verse 12. But you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. Jacob concludes by recalling God's promises from long ago. He's recalling a promise God made to him 20 years ago in chapter 28, verse 14. And he begins it by saying with a very clear emphasis in the text, but you, this I, but you, but you. You see, that's, that's the direction of our prayer. It always ought to be, but you, God. But you said, I will do you really, really good. That's Burkle paraphrase. I will make your offspring as the sand of the sea which cannot be numbered. Now, so far as I've been able to look at through the book of Genesis, I don't see that that phrase, I'll make your offspring as the sand of the sea, was ever told to Jacob. But it was promised to Abraham in chapter 22, verse 17. So what is Jacob doing? I believe what he's doing is he's saying, you see, God, I know I am the inheritor of the covenant of promise and that all the promises that were made to my grandfather Abraham were made to my father Isaac and are now made to me and will come to my children that we will have a nation from which would come a savior which will bless the nations. Jacob knows he's in the line of promise. We need to recall God's promises from long ago as well, do we not? What a beautiful prayer this is. Now, for most of us, particularly who come from an American culture, we begin with problems by saying, here's a problem, now let's plan the solution. Right? That's how we do it. Problem, plan the solution. This text tells us, problem, pray, and then plan. Verses 13 to 21 tell us the planning is actually enabled by prayer. Prayer enables the planning. Verse 13. So he stayed there that night, and from what he had with him, he took a present for his brother Esau. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 lambs, 30 milking camels and their calves, 40 cows and 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys and 10 male donkeys. That was probably the ancient version of cryptocurrency. These he handed over to his servants. Every drove by itself said to his servants, pass on ahead of me, put a space between drove and drove. He instructed the first, when he saw my brother meets you and asks you to whom do you belong, where are you going, and whose are these ahead of you, then you shall say they belong to your servant Esau. They are a present sent to my Lord Esau. And moreover, he is behind us. He likewise instructed the second and the third and all who followed the droves. You shall say the same thing to Esau when you find him. And you shall say, moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he thought, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me. And afterward, I shall see his face and perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him. And he himself stayed that night in the camp. Verse 13, Jacob spends the night on the north side of the Jabbok with his two camps. Can you imagine what a sleepless night that must have been? At least until we read what we're going to do, what we are going to read, believe it or not, in four weeks. We're going to leave Jacob and the Jabbok for three Sundays while we do the missions conference, right? (laughs) So you'll have to wait. 
But Jacob prepares gifts for Esau, trying to give Esau what he thought would appease him. He makes these groups of droves of stuff, and he keeps the droves afar, apart. And his reasoning is, that way Esau, when he attacks them, will tire of cutting through them with the sword. Verse 17, the first servant. How many of you wouldn't want to volunteer for that job? The first servant is told when Esau meets you that there's going to be a series of questions that you'll be asked. To whom do you belong? Where are you going? Who are these ahead of you? The servant is instructed in how to answer. They belong to your servant, Jacob. They are a present to my Lord, Esau, phrase my Lord, repeated three times here. And behold, also Jacob is behind us. And Jacob instructed the second and also the third and also who followed the droves saying that they should say the same thing when they encounter Esau, and also you'll say, behold, your servant Jacob is behind us. The idea is that the presence of these droves will satisfy Esau, and that Esau will accept them. The word face appears three times in, verses 20, in verse 20, uh, literally, it says, Jacob, uh, for he thought I may appease his face with the present that goes ahead of me. Afterward, I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept my face. The idea of this personal encounter that will somehow assuage Esau's long-held anger. Jacob is determined that this here at the Jabbok is where the issue, if there is any, will be resolved between him and his brother. We are again told at the end of this section in verse 21 that Jacob spends the night on the north side of the Jabbok. It's speaking of the same night that's described in verse 13. The emphasis of spending the night in both verse 13 and verse 21 serve as an envelope to help us understand what's going on in the text. Jacob is in turmoil of soul over meeting up with his brother. Now, how do we pray in our own time of turmoil? Jacob's fears, good and evil, uh, drove him to prayer. Are we as desperate for God? Or do we simply want to talk about our problems? The advice of Scripture here is that in the de moment of desperation, that's when we go to God. The testimony of believers through the centuries has been that when we meet up with a desperate time, a horrific time, and we go to the Lord in prayer, we learn more about God and we grow in our relationship with Him in such intimacy that the testimony that you read is almost universal. I am glad for the crisis because now I know God in ways I never would have. To run to God in that way. What fears trouble you at night? Jacob here is spending the night in the Jabbok. His fears are overwhelming him. What do you do about them? For many of us, we run them over and over in our minds, creating greater anxiety and sleeplessness. When in fact, what we can do is go to a good and kind God who cares about us and loves us and wants to hear from us. I remember when I was little, I had fears that kept me up at night. I'd go into my mom and dad's room, and it almost didn't matter. They were, you know, I just had fears about everything. <laughs> and my mom would teach me a, a song it was kind of in an Irish brogue that was very helpful to me. Uh, I'll sing it to you at risk of, of, the, of, 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 of violating the maxim, preachers should never sing 
and singers should never preach. I will violate it here. Cheer up, ye saints of God, there's nothing to worry about. Nothing to make you feel afraid. Nothing to make you doubt. Remember Jesus never fails, so why not trust him and shout? You'll be sorry you worried at all tomorrow morning. This is the hope that Jacob gives us here to say that we can take everything to the Lord in prayer. You know, another thing that we can think about is do you have a tendency to face trouble head on or do you try to put them off? I think for many of us, our fears kind of cause us to procrastinate and say, I, I'll deal with that maybe if it ever comes up, but for now, I'm going to avoid it. Jacob does not avoid the trouble. He goes straight to the Transjordan to meet up with Esau. Make peace first with God. Do it now, and then make peace with others. Don't put it off. Go. Asking God for help. Now, in every one of these uh, sections in Genesis, we've asked ourselves two questions. One is, how is the promise of God from a human perspective under threat? This promise that he begins with a person developed into a family, a nation. From that nation would come a savior. From the savior would come the blessing of the world. How is that under threat? Well, lots of ways here. The droves could get lost. Esau could take some or all of them. He could kill some or all of them. And that's Jacob's fear, right? That Esau with his 400 men is just going to mow through the crew. Jacob could have tried to avoid the problem by going a different route and spend his time kind of dancing around trying to avoid Esau or to put it off, but he doesn't. Instead, he deals with it straight on, which creates its own threats. The promise of God is under threat, and yet God, as we shall see the next time we come into Genesis, God meets Jacob in a very powerful way. The last question that we always ask ourselves in these texts is where do we see the gospel in this section of the Bible? Well, the first thing we need to know is that verse 1, God meets us first. Salvation is from God. And in all of our fears and turmoil, we too must talk with God. If we are to be saved, we must address God. If you want to be right with God, the first thing you got to do is address God. Not everybody else, you got to talk to Him. Recall His word of salvation. In the New Testament, that word is, whoever believes in Jesus will not perish but have everlasting life. Recall the word of of salvation. We should tell God our complete powerlessness and unworthiness. There's nothing we can do that can cause us to merit our salvation, to merit the deliverance from God. We should tell God of his unbelievable love and faithfulness. Say, God, thank you, love me. Thank you that you are faithful to save all who call on you. And we should plainly ask him to save us. Romans 10, whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Recalling his long ago promise that assures us of pardon as well. The blood of Jesus, God's son, purifies us from how many? All sin. Now, dear friends, I believe Jacob was actually a child of God before he praised this prayer. But it's a wonderful prayer that anyone who wants to be made right with God can pray. Address God. Recall God's word. State our complete powerlessness and unworthiness and God's love and faithfulness. Ask him to save us and recall his promises from long ago. But for those of you who do know Jesus, who have 
put your faith and hope in Christ and love him. This is also a good prayer for us to pray in desperate times, to address God, recall his word, state our complete powerlessness and unworthiness in his great love and faithfulness, to make our requests known to him and recall his promises from long ago and we can lift our heads in comfort. In these days, whether it is your own individual crises that keep you up at night, or your fears that weigh heavily upon you, or your worries about the world in which we live. I don't know if you know, but there's an election coming up. The fears about the world in which we live. Did you know that this pattern is exactly what God has in store for us? He bids us and invites us into his presence. I'm wondering if it might be helpful for us to conclude our service with prayer, since we've had teaching on prayer. Let this be a lab course, and let's take time to pray. As many of you as are physically able, I'd like to ask if we might kneel in prayer. Don't do it if it's going to hurt you, okay? (laughs) But let's just bow our knees before the Lord in prayer. Oh, great God, we begin by addressing you. You are the God of promise to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You are the Lord, the self-existent one. We recall your word, and we recite your word back to you in prayer. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That you are not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance that you did not send your son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And whoever believes in Jesus will not perish, but have everlasting life. We recall that, and we state our complete powerlessness and unworthiness to be so saved. And we thank you for your great love and faithfulness, which enables it. And now we make our requests to you. For some here, Lord, they may be praying in the quietness of this moment for you to reach down and save them by the death of Jesus at the cross. We pray that that would happen in this moment. That they would just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin by what you did at the cross. Lord, for those of us who already have put our faith in Jesus, we make our various requests to you. For some personal fears, that keep us up at night. For others, crises and troubles that seem impossible to resolve. Oh God, we lay them before you right now. Heavenly Father, as your people here, we, we pray for our nation in this election season. We, we live in a world where the value of babies in their mother's wombs is being disregarded. We live in a world where being made in your image, male and female, is being denied. Where your vision, your plan for marriage is being broken in so many ways. Lord, I pray that you would help us to know how we, as your people, ought to respond in the face of such things. And Lord, I especially want to think of the coarseness of the conversation and debate that happens particularly online but spills over into everyday relationships that is really serving to undo the threads of our commonality as a people. 
Lord, uh, it seems to be true of people from all political persuasions, so we pray that you'd help us to be those who speak always with grace, seasoned with salt, that we may know how to answer every person. Lord, we recall your promises from long ago that Jesus, you, by your death at the cross, have purified us from all sin. And we lift up our heads with joy, not because there's anything in us, but because there is so much in you. The God-man who has saved us, made us fit for a kingdom that you are building. Help us not to build our own kingdoms, not even to think about building yours, but rather to seek the kingdom of God and your righteousness. We pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.